in C.S. Lewis's wonderful book, The Great Divorce, he write, writes down what he describes as a dream about heaven and hell. This dream centers around the movements of this man who has died and arrives in heaven in the age to come. And this man finds that he steps out of the bus that has taken him to this new place, that while everything around him is perfectly solid, he appears in this place as a mere ghost when compared with the fullness of the reality that is before him. And in this new world, he knows that there's a journey for him to go on into the new land. But upon setting out on this journey, he finds that he can barely get going at all. Because in order to go, he needs to walk across the grass, which he is finding incredibly painful to do. The grass is too hard and too solid for the shadow of a man that he is. He is such a lightweight being that even the tips of the grass cut his feet because he is not heavy enough for the grass to bend over as he steps on it. It's a vivid picture that C.S. Lewis paints of this worldly man arriving in a place that is too solid for him. In describing the age to come in this way, C.S. Lewis is giving us a picture of the basic meaning of a word that we come across in our Bible hundreds of times. That word is glory. The Hebrew word for glory literally means heavy or weighty. And so in the great divorce, the ghost is a this ghost of a person arriving in the age to come and hurting his feet on the blades of grass lacks the glory that they require to survive in that place without somehow growing in substance so that they can walk on the grass and drink the water and live. The word glory is used right throughout the scriptures over and over, both in the Old and the New Testament. And it starts with this meaning of weight or heaviness. But this meaning, as with many words, then comes to be used as a metaphor of weight and heaviness. So you can speak about the gravity of a situation or the, it's about the importance, the authority of a person, or the significance of something. When God's glory appears in a storm cloud at Sinai, this is the physical manifestation of his power. Or when his glory shows us the light of his presence, it's about his radiance and brilliance and overwhelming goodness and holiness. Or like when the heavens are described as proclaiming the glory of God, they are physical expression of his beauty and his importance, his grandeur. Glory throughout the Bible is so often connected with who God is. But glory is then also used to describe humans. In Psalm 8, it's one of those places where it's expressed and revisited by many of the biblical writers. It says this, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your glory is everywhere, basically. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. Even children can see how awesome you must be if you made all this that surrounds us. The psalmist says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, I think, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? He's saying, when I look up and see how great you must be because of what you've made, I think, I'm tiny in comparison. And why would you even care about us? And he goes on to say, yet you have made humans a little lower than heavenly beings, and here it is, and crowned them with glory and honor. You've got to note here that humans aren't glorious and important and significant out of their own means. It's something that God has given them. Humans have a borrowed glory. 
Their sense of importance comes from God and his purposes for them. This whole psalm is written in praise of God, articulating his graciousness in what he has given to humanity to, re to reflect him. And so what is this glory and honor and that God has crowned humanity with look like? In verse 6, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. The glory is the work that he has given to do, to rule and to care for God's creation. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. In this song, the psalmist echoes back to Genesis 1, where humanity is created in God's image. And embedded in this idea of imaging God is glorifying the thing that we are imaging. That is meant to just happen by the fact of being. When the image of God properly reflects God, God is glorified. And so from this psalm, we learn that there's a way to be more or less fully human. To image God well is to be more fully human. That is, to live into this glory and honour that God has given us, to rule with him in his creation. But to be less fully human is to reject the glory that he has given and to seek our own honour and to define for ourselves what is best for us and the world. And this is what the Bible story outlines, how we have been given this honour, but either simply abdicated our responsibility as carriers of glory, or else pursued the glory and honour for ourselves to gain it by our own means. God has given us glory as humans. He's given us importance. But the way that we've used this importance for our own good as a, as a way of puffing ourselves up shows that in fact we have fallen short of the glory of God fallen short of the glory that he has intended for us to carry. And when we do this, we become lightweight humans that are not filled out in such a way that we can properly live into true reality. What I want to say today is actually very simple, and that's just this. Your work is the primary place that God is using to form you into his likeness, to become the kind of person who doesn't cut their feet on the grass of the age to come. Here's another way of saying it. It's the way that 19th century English Bishop J.C. Ryle communicates this same idea. He says, what could an unsanctified man do in heaven if by any chance he got there? Let that question be fairly looked in the face and fairly answered. No man can possibly be happy in a place where he is not in his element and where all around him is not congenial to his tastes, habits and character. Or here's another way of saying it. God's work beneath our work is to make us into heavyweight beings. This is God's process of sanctification, making us holy like him so that we live into the glory that God has crowned us with as humans. You see this in many passages right through the New Testament. The word glory is used 170 times in the New Testament alone. Let me read through two passages here. Only one of them actually mentions glory, but I want to help to connect this idea with our work how our work is used by God to do this. First in Romans 8. There's far too much in this passage to unpack. But if you focus on a couple of things, notice how Paul speaks about glory and how this is connected with being made like Jesus. In verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself 
will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. God's intent is for us to be conformed to the image of his son. This image language takes us back to the original purpose of humanity and says that Jesus is that new Adam. And through his work, by which we're justified, we're declared right before God, we can now take up our role and authority, the glory, as the new humanity. But it's not just like that new person is superimposed on top of who we were. Rather, God opens up the reality for this to happen and also then gives us the responsibility for the kinds of persons we will become. That's not to say that it's all up to us to become like him and he isn't working in us, not at all. Rather, it's to say that without him, we are unable to become who he intends us to be. But he will not force us to conform to that image against our will. Here's the second passage that I'll read where Paul talks about how we work with God in this process. You could look at others if you wanted, like in Colossians 3, 1 to 17, or Ephesians 2, 4 to 10. At the beginning of Philippians 2, where this passage is, Paul has outlined how our, in our relationships, we should have the same mindset as Jesus, who was the most glorious being in the universe. How he uses his authority is to use it to lay down his life for others. And after this beautiful hymn, Paul immediately goes on and says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, here it is, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Live it out in everything that you do, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. Work out your own salvation, for it is God who works in you. And then he goes on to give some examples of how you live it out in your approach and what you do and in the choices that you make. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, that is, humans made in God's image, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. God's intent for those who come to know Jesus as their king is to change them into his likeness, to do work in them that they might live as his children. So, if your work is the primary place that God is using to form you into his glorious likeness, an important question for us to wrestle with is, how is my work shaping me? And when I say work here, don't just think about employment. Think, how is all of my productive activity shaping me? What kind of person is it making me? because that's what God is interested in. I believe that the way that we understand the interaction between work and life 
significantly impacts the degree to which we will co cooperate with God's work of changing us into his likeness through our work. So to try to apply this, I want to outline three different ways that people might see this interaction between a person's work and their life. And you might have a look at the way that you understand this interaction as I outline these. Firstly, for many people, their work is their life. In this picture, there's like two circles and the circle of work and life overlap and fill each other entirely. Work might have started out as only being part of your life, but it grows to take up the whole space. In this scenario, someone's job grows to take over their life, in which case actually they become a, a smaller person. And as a result, their sense of who they are comes out of what they do. This is where a person's work is the means by which they find significance. They use their work to gain glory and honour for themselves. Maybe it's not as explicit as trying to win approval, but it's the sense that unless I'm being productive, I lack any sense of significance. I don't know who I am. I read the story of a young doctor early in her career who recalled a conversation with another doctor a few years ahead of her, and this other doctor ahead of her was pregnant. And one day they were chatting over lunch and the pregnant lady stopped and she said to this young doctor, do you know what I love most about being pregnant? And this young doctor recalls wanting to know because she hoped one day to have children and hoped for that feeling of connection with the baby in a womb. And this older doctor said, what I love most about being pregnant is I love it because it's the only time where I feel productive all the time. Even when I'm sleeping, I'm doing something. And this comment struck the younger doctor. And she sat with it for a long time. And she reflects, saying this, For many of us, being productive and doing becomes a signifier for who we are. It's an attempt at redemption. That is, through our work, we try to build our worth, security, and meaning. For some, what we do becomes our means of gaining glory, a sense of importance in this world. But it's not in a place of doing, but in a place of being that God in Genesis 1 and the psalmist in Psalm 8 describes God crowning us with glory and honour. Do you have this sense of self apart from your productivity? Are you able to say, who I am is not a question of doing, but of being? But in order to avoid this trap of my work defining my sense of who I am, some people then swing to another extreme, where our sense of self and who we are is separated from work entirely. Work is distinct from life. In this picture, it's like we have two separate circles, life and work. You've probably heard many people speak about work-life balance. And it's like there's a seesaw where we need to keep our work in check to make sure it doesn't get out of balance with the rest of our life. But if we disconnect work from our life and see them, begin seeing them as two separate things, or we, we denigrate work because we're afraid of making it an idol or of it taking over our sense of self, we're actually abdicating responsibility that God has given to us. Notice in Psalm 8, the glory and honour God has given to humanity is in order to work like him, to do what we're made to do in his image. It's not from our work that we gain glory or our sense of importance and significance, but the glory or significance given to us enables our work to be done in God-like ways, and it changes us as we do it. If the importance of work is removed from the process of being conformed to the image of God's Son, then the conformity for some people becomes all about 
these spiritual things like reading my Bible or praying or being in church, becoming a morally upright person. Of course, being crowned with glory includes living a morally up upright life. If you're going to learn from the Creator, you need to read and speak to Him. But if it doesn't give purpose to all of our meaningful activity, this is a much smaller vision than what I think God intends for humanity. Work is a primary way that God intends to form us to become people to serve like Him. And it is through our work, when we do it with our whole selves engaged in it, that He works through us. Frederick Biegner says it in this way, If you lose yourself in your work, you find who you are. If you express the best you have in you in your work, it is more than just the best you have in you that you are expressing. It's more than the best you have in you you are expressing because it's also God expressing himself through you by his spirit. You find who you are in your work because it's a tangible way of God making you more fully human like Jesus if you'll do it with him. And so it's neither helpful to think about our work as the means of finding our significance and as synonymous with identity, nor is it helpful to think about our work as disconnected from who God intends for us to be in his kingdom. Rather, we want to learn to see and understand that rightly ordered, work is an important part of life. In this picture, the smaller circle of work sits within the bigger circle of life. Listen to what Daryl Cosden says. Humanity's primary purpose for existing, to image God, involves taking active responsibility for creation and shaping and reshaping it appropriately ruling and subduing it through our productive working activities. This does not mean that we find our purpose or identities through what we do in our work apart from our relationship with God. But nor, as some expressions of spirituality suggest, do we find our identities in some existential, touchy-feely relationship with God alone, as if it were possible to image Him apart from acting like Him through our purpose which is to work. So while work doesn't give me my sense of self, it is a central aspect of my life which is intended to help form whom I'm becoming. And at this point, I think it's helpful to be able to make distinctions here between your life and your work, and for some of us, our jobs. Your life is who you are in all of your activities, in rest, and in your social interactions. Your work is a central part of your life, but it's not the whole thing. Your work is your productive activity that you engage in in life. It's the good that God is calling us to accomplish in the world. And this will include a whole range of different things for different people. So a question that you need to ask here is, what is the work that God has given you to do? For most, at some point in their life, their work includes a job. A job is what we get paid to do. Your job is an aspect of your work, but you shouldn't limit your thinking about your work only to your job. And I think we shouldn't do this for a very important reason, that is because you're a limited being with limited power and energy to do what God has given you to do. And he leaves it up to you to decide what kind of time and energy you will give to the various aspects of your work and for rest for that matter. If you think of your work only as your job, you're going to let that job fill up the entire work circle. And then you'll lack the energy and the time for other important things that you've been given to do. Like what, you might say? Well, for all of us, this includes the work of relationships. For some, that's in marriage. If you hadn't noticed, marriages take intentional work and should include some of your best energy. 
For some, it's the work of raising children. But sometimes a job will crowd out a person's children. Your work includes housework. It includes caring for others in family. It, the work of maintaining friendship and building new ones, of including the stranger, showing hospitality. It involves the ongoing work of study or learning, whether it's formal study or self-directed learning or the circumstantial learning based on the situations that we find ourselves in. What is all of the work that God has given you to do? Have you thought about that? And how are, you, how are you going in deciding how you're going to use your energy in a way that honours what God has entrusted you with in all your aspects of work? The reality is that you need help with that. God knows that. He knows that you're limited. And that's why he wants to do it with you, for you not to go it alone. This is what grace is. God working through you to do what you can't do on your own. It is my firm conviction that we need to stop trying to maintain this work-life balance and instead pay attention to our work-rest rhythms and how God leads us in these rhythms and what he's doing in these rhythms to grow us. It is in these rhythms in our various activities of work and rest and all the different situations that we encounter in these places that we cooperate with God as he forms who we are becoming. He's filling us out so that we live into the glorious beings that he intends us to be, to live lives that carry more weight, to wear that crown of authority both now and in the future. One of the aspects of reality that you probably don't need me to tell you is that while much of this work is very enjoyable and rewarding, some of this work is very hard work. Being filled out into a fuller, more glorious person turns out not to be an easy thing much of the time. And so we constantly encounter difficulty as we wrestle with ourselves and face challenges in our work and suffering in our bodies and opposition from outside. If anyone knew this reality, it was the Apostle Paul. He faced challenge after challenge in the work that God had given him to do. And yet he says that it is precisely through this work that God is enabling him to live into the significance that God intends. For himself, yes, but also for other people. And more than that, Paul understands that a life that is shaped after Jesus' life is one which carries the most weight, the most glory. And that life is necessarily one that involves suffering. It's a cruciform life, which when endured in connection with God, in reliance and trust in the way that Jesus does, itself leads to glory. Because the things that actually carry the most weight in this world are not things like anger and aggression and getting our own way in outward displays of power, but kindness and gentleness and patience and laying your life down for others. And so as we finish, I want to read a passage from 2 Corinthians 4, where Paul speaks of the way in which the suffering now, the difficulty now, is forming us into more glorious beings. He says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure, this glory, in jars of clay. Our lives are like clay. We're so useful and yet so fragile. And this is to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And here's the reality of the work that we're engaged in, like it was for Paul. We're hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. 
For we who are alive are always be given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. That is, so that we might become more glorious like him. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who has raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. And then he finishes with this. And hear these words in light of what God is doing in and through you as you trust and walk with him in the work he's given you. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly, we are wasting away. Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. All of this difficulty in the present and work is the very place where we encounter the difficulty much of the time. This is the means by which God is forming you into a more glorious being. Will you allow him to continue to do that work in you? May your work be that place where God can do his work beneath the work, so that you might be conformed to the image of his son, so that you might grow into a more weighty, more substantial, more glorious human being to the glory of God.